All right, time for the main message this morning. And if you have your Bibles, turn with me to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15. And we'll be reading pretty much the whole chapter uh, this morning. But uh, we'll start off with verses 1 to 7. Luke chapter 15, verses 1 to 7. Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for him for to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. And he spake this parable unto them, saying, What man of you, having an hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness, in the wilderness, and go after that which is lost, until he find it? And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbours, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and let's commit this time to him. Father, we thank you once again for this time we can look into your word and we pray that you would be our teacher this morning. I pray that you would use me to share the words you have given to me that I might be an encouragement to my brethren. And I pray if there is any who is listening to this uh, sermon this morning, that they would be drawn to you, they'd be convicted of their sin, and they would turn to Jesus and receive salvation from him. We thank you once again for all your goodness to us, and we pray that we would grow today by your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There are some people in this world, in fact, a number of people in this world, who are convinced that they have the right argument when it comes to deciding whether God exists or not. And uh, they provide these arguments as an excuse for them not, to, not to, for them not to have to believe in him at all. One of those is the existence of suffering in this world. Then, as we look around, we see suffering in this world, and we see um, uh, many people that have passed away because of this pandemic, and people being, you know, confined to their homes and 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 going through things that seem rather strange and sometimes scary. Um, but there's a lot, a whole lot of other suffering that goes on in the world. And there's plenty of uh, uh, plagues and, and uh, injustices that occur. And there are natural disasters and a whole lot of other things. Um, and uh, I'm sure you understand what I'm talking about. And so these people who look at the suffering around us argue, they see the suffering, and they argue that God um, can't exist because of that suffering. And they argue that because of two main reasons. You see, we believe a God who is omnipotent and a God who is loving. And they argue that if God was omnipotent and loving, if he is om- and he hasn't removed suffering, then they argue because he hasn't removed it, he's either not omnipotent, which means that he doesn't have the power to remove suffering, or he's not loving, or both. Therefore, they conclude that the God of the Bible doesn't exist. Of course, they need to admit a number of other things in that particular argument. Obviously, the free will of man, they have to sort of bypass and, and sort of say, well, you know, but if you if you have free will, then you have to have the free will to cause suffering as well. And either God takes away our free will and makes us robots, and in doing so, we don't we're not human anymore. So they have to leave that part of it out, or He leaves us with free will, and we get a. a, a chance to choose or to make a choice whether to love or to cause suffering um, they also have to admit the fall of man and the rebellion that we have uh, committed against god they also have to admit things such as the fallen angelic beings who also had a free will to choose whether to worship god or whether to want to be try and become gods themselves and that love and power are not always demonstrated best or most clearly by simply removing evil, but by entering into another person's suffering and to defeat that suffering with love. From God's perspective, love is best revealed by coming to save mankind, by him coming to save mankind, by entering into our sufferings, even though we didn't deserve it. That's why John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Today, we will examine a trinity of parables designed to teach one 
very important lesson and to answer one interesting challenge that was presented to Jesus. Before we do that, let's look at some good principles that we can use to help us understand parables better. So I'm just going to give you a few tools that you can use uh, when you're reading your parables or when you're reading even the Gospels or anything in the Gospels on how to understand them better. And one of the, one of the first thing, things to note when you're seeking the meaning of a particular passage or a parable is to check who Jesus was actually talking to, because that makes a world of difference. You see, if he was talking to his disciples, that's one thing. But if he's talking to Pharisees, who he may have been arguing against, that may be something else. In most cases, the information about who Jesus is speaking to is provided right at the beginning of that passage or at the beginning of the chapter. Also, when it comes to parables, Jesus often provides more than one parable at a time to teach an important truth. Each one is teaching a same sort of message, but from a slightly different angle. And together, they give you a full illustration of a particular truth, like the different facets of a diamond when you look at it from different angles. Another good thing to know when you're trying to understand the Bible or understand a parable is what context that passage is sitting in. What are the circumstances that are going on? What's happened just before that and during that? When were the words actually spoken? In this passage, Jesus had just finished explaining the need for someone who wants to be his disciples to carefully consider the cost of becoming a disciple. And that finishes up that way in chapter 14. He wasn't saying this in a metaphorical way either, but in a very practical way. You see, because to follow Jesus as his disciples in those days meant that you had to leave everything behind. And the odds were that you were going to be shunned by society and you'd be rejected by them because they would ultimately reject Jesus, and Jesus knew it. In fact, Jesus' disciples pretty much all died, except for John, and we understand that, but he was even imprisoned in his later life. So we found, and we find in this particular passage, that Jesus had just finished speaking about, if you want to be my disciple, count the cost, because it's not going to be cheap. It's going to cost you dearly to be my disciple and to follow me around. And we find that despite this, chapter 15 starts with a very interesting verse. It says in Luke 15, 1, Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. So despite that, the publicans and the sinners were there wanting to hear more from him. And now it describes these people as publicans and sinners. Now today, publicans are often uh, thought of as people who run pubs or run hotels. But that's not what the definition of a publican is in this particular passage. Publicans were the tax collectors of their day. And they were pretty much one of the most despised groups uh, in Israel at that time. They were despised people because they were actually Jews who were collaborating with the Roman Empire. See, most of you would understand that um, Israel was under the dominion of Rome. And these Jews, who were publicans, were cooperating with the Roman Empire to collect taxes and tolls and for other various persons. So in other words, they were collaborating with them. And oftentimes they actually profited from the taxes that they collected. You see, they got to keep a percentage of whatever they collected. So often they took advantage of that. And so publicans were neither liked nor trusted by the Jews in general. They were hated generally. Sinners were people who were considered not morally upright at all. Most of them either didn't believe didn't follow the commands of the Old Testament, weren't involved in, in, in going to, you know, to, to church on, a, on, a, on, a, on the Sabbath or involving their families. Oftentimes these people were not necessarily even part of families. But these people had probably involved themselves in things that were considered very sinful. These included people like prostitutes. In short, both of these particular groups, publicans 
and sinners were really the outcasts of their society. They didn't fit in. They weren't considered good people. They weren't trusted and they were looked down upon. Especially by the people in religious circles. People who were higher up in the church at that day. And the church wasn't existing in, at, at that time. Um, but the temple was running and the, the system of the Old Testament was still in play. These people, who were the Pharisees and the scribes, and they're mentioned in a moment, um, considered it too dangerous to be anywhere near these other types of people. Because if you spent time with them, you would ultimately corrupt yourself. You see, a bit like a leper um, had to stay distant, they treated them the same way. If you hung around them too much, if you received them, then you had the possibility of becoming like them. So they wanted nothing to do with them. They were too dangerous even to be close to. And it says in Luke chapter 15, verse 2, And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. You see, the scribes and Pharisees were the super religious teachers of their day. They were really respected. They were conservative. They were knowledgeable. And they were very influential people. They represented the whole, the mosaic system that was uh, running. Um, and these people, when Jesus came along, had their doubts about him. You see, he didn't seem to fit what they were anticipating in the Messiah. Um, he didn't look like the Messiah they were looking for. Um, and on top of that, they noticed that he spent a little bit too much time with people who were not like them. You see, so as Jesus is speaking and spending time with publicans and sinners, teaching them, it, he wasn't spending time with the Pharisees and the scribes. It didn't make them feel too good about themselves. If this is the Messiah, he'd want to spend time with us, they thought. Why is he spending time with these types of people? Doesn't he know if he's really the Messiah, if he's really a prophet of God, surely he'd know who these people are. And so they reasoned within themselves that because he was spending time with the unholy, that he was more than likely unholy himself. Were they correct? Was he guilty of associating with sin? Was he defiling himself or disqualifying himself as a real prophet of God or as a Messiah by what he was doing? Well, their accusation was that he was receiving sinners and eating with them. Was he guilty of that? Well, let's see the answer that Jesus gives through three parables that he, that he gives us, one straight after the other, in Luke chapter 15. Now look at verse 4. And he starts with these words. He says, What man of you, having an hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, does not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it? And when he hath found it, he layeth it upon his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbours, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which is lost. And I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth, more than over ninety and nine persons which need no repentance. So Jesus appeals to their knowledge of sheep. And Jesus appeals to those who understood what it meant to shepherd sheep. Those who understood how valuable they actually were. And he reasons that if you lost one of them, you would focus your attention on getting that lost one back rather than worrying about the 99 that were safely together. The endeavour to find the sheep or the place where, where the, the sheep is lost is in the middle of the wilderness. And this is a picture of the earth. 
it is really a desolate and dangerous place. And for a sheep to be alone is a very dangerous place to be. So the thought of the of the shepherd is to find that sheep. You see, if wolves are about, the way wolves work is to isolate a, a weak sheep or a lamb from the rest of the flock. Because when it's isolated, they can easily bring it down. And so the thoughts and the concerns of the shepherd would be to find the sheep before it was killed. So the shepherd has a heart for the sheep. He has a heart for the sheep that is lost. And it's a bit like a person. If they're lost in sin, then the direction should be focused on them. And what does he do? It says that he continues to look until he finds it. The work continues until the sheep is found. But unfortunately, we'll conclude if the sheep dies. He continues, and not, not only will your efforts be focused on finding the lost sheep, because you care so much for it and you don't want to see it killed. But when you find it, you rejoice and you put it on your shoulders and you, and you bring it home with you. And so much so, the joy is so strong that you want others to celebrate with you. Jesus then concludes that heaven is the same as this type of person, as this type of shepherd. The lost sheep is like a person who is lost in sin and needs rescuing. While there is one who is in sin, the focus needs to be to find him or her. Much effort is put in and the effort does not cease. Heaven itself, Jesus says, experiences rejoicing when one sinner is saved. What a beautiful picture of the nature of God and the nature of heaven. He rejoices and even celebrates with the angels. You celebrate with him when one person is saved. The picture here is that God is like a loving shepherd. And the clear message is that God loves his people. The teachers, pastors, scribes, Pharisees, and so on that were living in those times were maybe not exhibiting the heart that God has. Those with the knowledge and responsibility to care for the sheep were not even looking for the sheep. They were writing off the sheep. Their heart should have been like God's. Their effort in line with his. Their love for their fellow man like him. The message is both to the publicans and the sinners. And the message was very clear. To the sinners, it was God loves you and he wants you back home with him safely. Stop running away from God. Stop being lost in the wilderness where there is no hope for you, where there's only wolves. Because God is looking for a time when he can carry you on his own shoulders and bring you back home and rejoice over you. And to the Pharisees, the message is also clear. Be more like God. Have God's heart. Love people who are who are lost in the wilderness. And let's have a look at the second parable and let's see how it relates to the first. Luke 15, 8 says, Either what woman having ten pieces of silver, if she lose one of them, doth not light a candle and sweep the house and seek diligently till she find it? And when she had found it, she calleth her friends and her neighbours together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I had lost. Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. Jesus once again speaks of something of great value, but is part of another group that belongs together with the other group, with the rest of it. This coin represents the sinner, a lost one, much like the sheep. In this case, we have a woman in her home 
her focus when the, when the coin is lost and the silver coin would be worth a fair bit, her focus immediately turns to the lost coin, knowing that the others are safe. And what does she do? She lights a candle so she can see the floor better, so she can see it more clearly. And she begins to sweep the floor methodically until she finds it. Just like the previous parable, the woman is seen to be persistent and methodical in her approach. The coin is far too valuable to do this thing haphazardly. It's too important a job. The darkness of the house is a bit like the darkness of this world. You need to have the light of God's truth to shine and reveal the state and the place of the coin. You see, in order for you to see better, you need God's light to show you. Without that light, finding the coin is an impossible task. Once again, we see the woman when she finds it celebrating together with her friends and neighbours. Once again, Jesus likens the salvation of one sinner as a time of great rejoicing in heaven. That's how precious people are to God. Each person, one person, is important to God and even to his angels. And that includes every sinner that is lost. Once again, the message to the religious leaders of the day, the Pharisees and the scribes, was they should be more like the woman. They should be out there seeking the lost, sweeping the floor, lighting that candle to show where that coin is. Because this is heaven's heart. And if you're a teacher of the Bible, if you're a teacher of truth, if you yourself are secure and say you're secure, then you represent God's kingdom on the earth. You should have God's nature on the earth. To the publicans and sinners, Jesus is teaching them that their real worth is immense to God and to, and to him, but in their lost state, their value is hidden. They're surrounded with darkness. You need the light to even recognize that you are not where you are supposed to be. You need to be in a protected treasury along with the other silver coins and not among the dust and the dirt of the floor under some piece of furniture. God indeed loves every sinner. There is none that he does not love and does not want saved. And finally, we have this from Jesus. And you'll recognize this parable as the story of the prodigal son. And I'll read this through once and we'll have a look at it. And the question is, is it like the other ones? Is he teaching the same thing again? Well, let's have a look at verse 11 to the end of the chapter. It says, and he said, a certain man in verse 11 had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the young, younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country. And there wasted his substance with riotous living. When he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and I am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when, his, when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. 
And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight. I am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to the servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again, and he was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. Now his eldest son was in the field, and he came and drew nigh to the house, and he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said unto him, Thy brother is come, and thy father hath killed the fatted calf, because he hath received him safe and sound. And he was angry, and would not go in. Therefore came out his father, and entreated him. And he answered, answering, said to his father, Lo, these many years I do serve thee, neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment, and yet thou never gavest me a kid, that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this thy son was come, which hath devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. And he said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me and all that I have is thine. It was meet that we should make merry and be glad. For this, thy brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. In this passage, a loving father has only two sons. One decides, the younger one, probably the more foolish one, decides to cash in on his inheritance and says, I want to go my own way. And in doing so, he leaves and goes to a far away country, a place very far from his home, and squanders all of his wealth. He engages in riotous living. That means living a very sinful life with the money that he, that he possessed. And he found himself in a very difficult place. He, found him, he finds himself, after he spends all his money, penniless and alone. No one cares for him. No one wants him. He joins himself to a particular man who, who gives him some work to do to feed pigs. He has, by his own decision, devalued his own life, forsaken his own family, far away from home and from those who love him, and he's fallen into a deep pit. When he realises, when it says he comes to himself, when he realizes his true state and remembers the love that existed in his father's household, he realizes he should be back there. And he repents and seeks to be accepted back, not as a son, because he feels like he's not worthy anymore to be a son, but he simply wants to go back and says, look, I'll be one of the workers now, because at least the workers have bread over there. And he believes that he sold his birthright and is no longer eligible to even be called a son. So he repents, which means he changes his mind about the life that he's living, and he wants to return to a previous life. And he's willing to work for it. And he says in verse 18, I will arise and go to my father, and I will say unto, my, unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven. There's repentance. And before thee, there's contrition. And I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. There's only one problem with his thought there. It wasn't the repentance that was wrong. It was that his father never stopped loving him. Never stopped thinking about him. And in verse 20, it says that, it says, And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. How can a person be not moved by this story? As soon as his father sees him, he immediately has compassion on him and runs to him, hugs him, kisses him. And before the son even had a chance to say, I'll be happy to be one of your workers, The father says in verse 22, bring forth the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. 
He then orders the servants to get a huge feast ready because of his son's return. Little side note over here. The servants represent the angels again. And why is he preparing a feast? Because his son was dead and now was alive again. He's back home. Sounds a lot like being born again for those of you who know what that means. Because in Luke 15, 24, he says, For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to make merry. Is it the same message? Yeah. It's the same message. The message to the publicans and the sinners was once again clear. As long as they were in their current state, they were spiritually dead and living in a very debased way. Though they were born to be members of God's family, they'd chosen to leave and were far from God, just like being in a faraway country. But God had never stopped loving them, never stopped thinking about them. He was always ready to receive them back and to make them a child of his household again to restore their true position if they would only recognize where they were. And they would return to him. There was no need to work for your salvation. There was no need to work and become a servant. You just received it. And you'd be clothed with the best robe, with a ring of status and with shoes upon your feet. Clothed in the righteousness of God himself. What an invitation. What a picture of the God who we believe in, that he from afar away would run to us, would embrace us and kiss us as he welcomes us home. The message is clear, both to the publicans and sinners and the Pharisees and the scribes. You see, there's a curious end to this story. And it's the story of the other son. Instead of rejoicing that his own brother had come home and was now safe and alive, he instead becomes angry and is obviously jealous. And so listen to his complaint. In verse 29 and 30, he says, an answering said to his father, Lo, these many years... Do I serve thee? Neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment, and thou hast never, that thou never gavest me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this thy son was come, which hath devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed him the fatted calf. Who was Jesus likening the faithful son to? Well, he's likening the faithful son to the scribes and the teachers who had been faithful to God during their lives. Their disdain for the publicans and sinners is very much like the faithful son to the prodigal son. They are more concerned about themselves when they compare themselves. How dare God give them something that they don't deserve when I've been faithful, I deserve all the attention. I deserve the fatted calf. They're more concerned about themselves rather than rejoicing that their brother has been saved. They have judged the other of not even being worthy of repentance and would rather not even receive them nor eat with them. But the father reasons with the son in this story and he says, son, thou art ever with me. You're always with me and everything that I have, have belongs to you. It was meet, it was right that we should make merry and be glad. For this thy brother was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Yes, the father says it's right that we rejoice and be glad because your own brother, your flesh and blood, 
was dead and is alive. He was lost, just like the sheep and the coin, but he's now found. Now Jesus, I feel, is being really gentle here with the, Phar with the uh, Pharisees and the scribes. And I'm sure that among them, there were those who actually loved God and were wondering what to do. So maybe they judged their brother to be unworthy of repentance. Maybe they judged their brother to be less than they were because of their faithfulness, because of what they were doing. But Jesus also knew that despite his gentle words, that the faithful ones, the ones that are always with God, there were those who would not hear his message and hold on to their pride and jealousy. The message is the same for all three parables. God treasures the sinner and wants to see them saved. And if you're already saved, if you are and belong to God, then your desire should also be for that lost one to be found. You know, there was someone there that day, I am sure, who probably had a tear welling up in his own eyes as he heard Jesus teach these parables. Why do I say that? Because it probably spoke directly to him. He may have even known some of the people, some of those publicans and sinners who were there. And it was one of Jesus' own precious disciples. A man who was called the same way and experienced the same complaint and intolerance as the publicans and sinners were now displaying toward, sorry, the, the Pharisees and scribes were displaying towards the, the Pharisees and the, the publicans and sinners. Turn with me to Luke chapter 5, verse 27 for a moment. I want to share with you something here. Luke chapter 5, verse 27. It says, And after these things he went forth and saw a publican. There you go. One of those tax collectors named Levi, sitting at the receipt of custom. And he said unto him, Follow me. And he left all, rose up, and followed him. And Levi made him a great feast in his own house. And there was a great company of publicans and of others that sat down with them. But their scribes and Pharisees murmured against his disciples, saying, Why do ye eat and drink with publicans and sinners? And Jesus answering said unto them, They that are whole need not a physician but they that are sick. I am come, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So how did Jesus answer their complaint? How did Jesus answer their, their challenge? Was he guilty of receiving sinners? Praise God, yes he was. He was guilty of receiving sinners. He came for all that were lost. And that included everyone, even the ones who thought they were okay. And what does it mean that he received sinners? Well, it means that despite your spiritual state or your position in this world, regardless of whether you are, whether you're high up that ladder or whether you're right down at the bottom, whether you feel like an outcast or whether you're one of the in-group, you are a sinner in God's eyes but he is willing to welcome you into his grace, to his love and his forgiveness. In fact, his desire, his desire to receive people is so great that he is willing to receive the absolute worst of sinners right into his own family. How is a person received into God's own family? when you simply receive him. You see, your free will is still there. He won't force you to come back. It's still your choice. When you receive him, you receive his message. He receives you. 
What's that message? Well, that message is called the gospel, the good news. The good news is that despite the fact that we are all sinners and worthy only of eternal damnation and an eternal death sentence, he paid our penalty on that cross at Calvary, which opened the door to being completely forgiven and being received into heaven's family. That's why Jesus came into the world. You see, he was the shepherd who came into the world looking for the sheep. He was the woman who was sweeping the floor looking for the silver coin. He was the father who was ready to embrace a son who would simply change his mind and say, I don't belong in the world anymore. I belong with you. The effort taken by the shepherd in the wilderness, by the woman sweeping in the darkness, and the father who rejoiced in a son shows the heart of God revealed in Jesus Christ. His, his effort, the amazing effort, demonstrates his amazing love. Jesus came into the wilderness and darkness of this world to find us and restore us back to God. We are precious in his sight. Whether you're saved this morning or whether you are unsaved, you are still precious in his sight. And we know that we are precious in his sight because of the price that he was willing to pay for us. I commenced this morning's sermon saying that there are, there are people in this world who look at the suffering and use that suffering as a way to point the finger at God or to dismiss him altogether. But you know what the Bible teaches? The Bible teaches that God has not stopped searching for them who are lost and are in pain and are in suffering, and neither should we. The real problem of suffering really starts and ends with us. We are lost and broken. We're the ones who chose to squander all of our wealth in sin. We're the ones who broke what God gave us. We're the ones who are in darkness, not even realizing where we are. But by the grace of God and by the light of his word, the Bible says we can know where we are. Because the Bible is like a mirror that shows us our true state. Mankind is broken and lost, but God's absolute desire is to restore us. God loves man perfectly, but neither the devil and his angels nor man himself is capable of truly loving man. The love that God has toward mankind is defined by, first of all, what he was willing to pay to find and save us, the life of his only begotten son, but also how he treats one sinner that is saved and how he responds to that salvation, all of heaven rejoices. That's why John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Now the call goes out to those of us who have been saved. The 99 sheep that are safe. The nine silver coins that are in the treasury. The faithful son who is with his father. Love those who are outside of God's kingdom. Treasure them the same way God treasures them. Let him search and save them through you and me. Do not rest, do not cease until they are found. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 43, Jesus says, You've heard that it has been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. 
for he maketh his sun to rise on the evil and on the good, and send a throne on the just and on the unjust. You know what? If you read that passage and you dwell upon it, you realize that we don't have any enemies in this world. There are only souls that are lost and need saving. True, most of them don't want, even want to be saved. They don't see their state. But that's not our choice to make. We are never to write them off. Otherwise, we become like the Pharisees and the scribes. The publicans and the sinners were willing to hear what Jesus had to say, and he was willing to receive them and tell them what they needed to hear. And that should be like us. We should always be willing to give an answer, as the Apostle Peter says, for the hope that we have in us. To anyone who will listen, to anyone who will receive this message, to anyone who is out there, Jesus loves you and he died for you. Christian, are you willing to receive sinners for the sake of the gospel? If you don't know what it means to be saved by Jesus Christ, then I invite you this morning to come to know him. There is a great gulf between you and God, and he longs to have you together with him. Because of your sin, you become alienated from him. You don't recognize where you are. But by dying on a cross, a lonely cross at Calvary, by dying for your sins and mine, Jesus bridged the gulf that is be between God and man, between a lost son and a loving father. Repent of your sin. Change your mind. Receive Jesus as Lord and Saviour, and you will receive complete forgiveness in the blink of an eye. A new start, a new life, eternal in nature that can never be taken away from you. There is room at the cross for you. God bless you all.